Hi, I'm Marge Charmley, and I'm from St. Paul. And my co-host, Anita Kozan from Minneapolis, is not here tonight, but will be joining us at future shows. Anyway, welcome to Buy Cities, a program by, for, and about the Buy Plus community and our friends and allies. We are thrilled that you are here with us tonight. If you haven't ever watched Buy Cities before, we are the longest running show, television show in the history of the world on bisexuality. So welcome to the show. And if you've been a previous viewer, welcome back. We've been off the air for a couple of years, but we're back in, in fine form, we hope. Tonight we have two wonderful guests with us, and I'm sure you're going to find their story very compelling. Allie Sands and Reese Preston are a couple, and they're going to be telling their very special love story tonight. So, Allie Sands, welcome. Thank you. And Reese Preston, welcome to Buy Cities. Thanks. Thanks so wonderful Marge. to have you. Yeah. Well, you and I go back a ways, Reese. Yes, we, we do. We met in another lifetime, you know, for all of us when when we were just about <coughs> twelve, I think. I think so. <laughs> Not quite sure. Playing softball. Anyway, Allie, you have written a book about your very special relationship with Reese, and. Could you tell us a little bit about the book? How, how did your book, what's the name of it? Mm -hmm. uh, how did it come to pass? Just Definitely. take it away. So the book is called, I Know Who You Are, But What Am I? A Partner's Perspective on Transgender Love. And the book started actually as my personal journal. And when Reese came and told me one evening in 2005 that he wanted to transition from female to male, I began writing that night, literally. I wrote what he told me that night verbatim, how I was feeling, and from there on, I started writing every couple days. And what was really important about this piece was that it, it was something that I would often read to him. I would ask him, do you want me to read to you what I've written? And it kept us connected in a way that a lot of couples don't stay connected in this kind of a transition. And I continued writing for about three years. And you know, it wasn't ever intended to be for the public's viewing. It was just something that was very intimate between the two of us. It was, it was my pouring out of confusion, my questioning my own identity. A lot of rawness is in this book. But as time went on, I realized that there were a lot of people in the trans queer community and a lot of partners that wanted to know more about what this means for me if my partner's transitioning, does that mean my identity is changing? And so little by little, I would start letting people read pieces and portions of this journal. And fast forward into 2015, I think, I was connected to a publisher that I won't name here right now, but they asked if, they, if I would be willing to publish this book. At that point in time, I turned to Reese and I said, this is up to you because there is so much intimacy and rawness in this journal that I wasn't sure if that's something that he would want to be publicized. Mm -hmm. So he said yes, and we moved forward, and the book was published in the fall of 2016. It is currently out of publication because it is being republished under a new publisher as a second edition and repackaged with a better cover. It's just going to be a more accessible piece to people who maybe can't afford it, for people who that are in different areas of the world that need it in other languages through Kindle and things like that. We're giving it a second chance. This might be a good time to show the audience the book, <clears throat> which will be coming out again in February. Right. This is the old edition. This is the first edition. And the second edition will be available on Amazon in February. It's a great cover, by the way. Thanks. It's going to have a new cover. But this one's great, and I'm sure the second one will be great, too. I hope so. I yeah, do. Yeah. Well, you know, as the two of you know, I work as a psychologist, and I work a lot with people that are transitioning and, you know, looking at medical interventions and so on and so forth. And what's really lacking is resources for spouses. I mean, yes. there are resources probably for trans people, too, but it's this is a much needed. We would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you basically started out, this was kind of your therapy in some ways, to just Very journal much. about it. And did you know anybody back then that was in a similar situation to you? Well, through our community, we met other couples, uh -huh. but oftentimes they would fall off because the partner would originally identify as a lesbian, and then when they realized their partner was transitioning to male, 
they just didn't know where they fit into that entire part of their life and they a lot of times would break up. There's a lot of stress in it. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, physical changes, emotional changes, it's financially taxing on the couple. I just think that we've got that special thing that we were able to stay connected throughout the different pieces of this. It wasn't easy. I'm not going to lie to you that yeah, it was easy. Yeah. And it, that's written there. And partly what you're saying is that you would share this with Reese as you went along. And, you know, what a lovely way to share your intimacy. And, I, you know, I wouldn't have thought about doing that as a way to sort of keep people connected. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was a conscious <clears throat> yeah. thought. I just thought that it helped him understand. It's almost like I was speaking to him in the third person uh, okay. through reading what I had already written. All right. And I think that he can attest to the fact that, you know, it's a very self-focused process to transition physically, yep. as it should be. Yeah. It's yeah. not something that you should have to think about somebody else first every day. But as his partner, I want to be thought of first sometimes. Yeah. And so I think it made him realize, I mean, he can speak for himself, that I was going through a process also. Yeah. And I think sometimes spouses get lost in that. They feel like a tornado is going through I the home. So. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, what can totally. I do? Yeah. I think so. So, Reese, what, what was it like for you, you know, for Allie to be writing this? She was sharing her... her well, like feelings, Allie and said, and you were still coming out and coming to, yeah, you know. So I, we didn't know it was going to be published. All right. I mean, this was, you know, she's writing, and I'm like, great. And she would read, you know, different parts to me, and it, I was like, wow, because I just wanted to go forward. I wanted to be done. Yeah. I wanted the beard to happen. I'm pinching on my face to make hair grow, and I know yeah. that's not going to happen. I mean, <clears throat> so it wasn't, you know, fast forward when it was about to be published, we then discussed that, and am I okay with it? Because I was gonna live my life stealth. Okay. I did not want to be out. All right. I did not want to be the poster trans person for yep. anyone, and I was really tired of the, you know, during transition and not being seen, being misgendered, um, and that constant battle with being seen for who you are. It's yeah. a tiresome battle, it's very depressing, and <clears throat> for most trans people, and including myself, you tend to then go back further into the closet. Okay. So this book helped, you know, we stayed connected um, and lots of therapy, you know, to be aware of the process, but I wanted it to be done. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, that's... hindsight's twenty twenty. looking back, I wish I also journaled and I could see the process, but I just wanted it to be done, even though it was a 10-year process. Yeah. So... Definitely a process, not an event. It, totally a process. <laughs> yeah. And coming out is that way anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just every time I meet somebody new, do I come out, do I not, what do I do? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yes. But the irony in that for the partner is that the less and less that he's visible, the more invisible I become in my own identity. Okay. And as a person that's really done a lot of identity work and searching, I didn't want to give up my, my queer identity. And therefore, him being, look at him. When we're in public, if we go to gay pride, people think we're like wonderful, hetero, oh, yeah. you pass. normative you pa you parents pass that are there straight, to support yeah. their child or something. Yep. And I don't feel seen. And no one wants to walk through the world feeling invisible. Yep. But there's a huge part of who I am, if he's not out, that I have a really difficult time finding places where I can have my identity. Yeah. So. I feel that his gift to me was allowing this book to be published because there's no way that, that, that we can hide now. And people, I'm being seen. I'm having a chance to share my experience as a partner after helping him go through this entire thing and supporting him through it. So it's kind of a really, it's a full circle event for us, I think, mm -hmm. as a couple, which is really great now. So I promised you when we were talking before the show that I, I would ask, being that this is by cities along the way, you went from being with a, in an intimate relationship with a person in a female body to now being with a man. Mm -hmm. Did you ever consider yourself as bi, or how did you identify? I mean, you I said, mean, what I am considered I here? myself as everything. I'm, everything. 
I didn't, I was really naive when this all started. Uh -huh. I didn't know what that meant for me. I just really wanted for him to be okay. Okay. And it was such a, it was very fast and furious once it started. But I thought a lot about my identity. People would ask me, does that still mean that you're a lesbian? I never had said that I was a lesbian. Uh -huh. So evolving through all of it, I really, the word queer resonates with me. Uh -huh. And I know that a lot of people in our community are offended by that word. That word was used against our community yep. in a lot of ways. And yet I think it's really important to, as a new generation of people, take that word back in power mm -hmm. because that's what it was used. It was used to try to like take away the power of our community. Right. And that's why for me the word queer means that I am I, I, I'm attracted to people outside of the gender and sex binary. Okay. I'd probably, I'm not attracted to anyone else really other than race. We've been together going on 17 years now and it's, yeah. it's been wonderful. Yeah. But if I was gonna go out and date someone, I would probably end up in a relationship with a very masculine female bodied person okay. who then maybe three years later would tell me they wanna transition to male. Yep, <laughs> and then and I'd be all over the place, that, right? all yeah, over yeah, again. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, I, I don't know that I ever thought of myself as bi. I hate those labels, really. Yeah. In a lot of ways, I think we need to get away from them. We talk about this a lot. So for me, I'm just Allie. I, I'm queer. I feel queer in the, in the fact that I don't. I've lost a lot for my identity. My community can resonate with that my family members walked away from me because of my identity. And to me, there's something radical about saying that you're queer. It means that you've, that you've sacrificed to have that identity. And I definitely feel that for myself. And I'm really grateful to Reese that he can embrace that identity for me when that's not really necessarily how he identifies. Right. right. Well, it's kind of a challenge if you're kind of a bi plus person anyway, because we get misidentified with our sexual orientation. That's right. If I'm with That's a woman, true. then people assume I'm a lesbian and I'm not. If I'm with a man, then I'm straight. Right. And so, you know, it's kind of like, no, I'm me no matter what. Mm -hmm. But it can get lost out there in the other world. Mm -hmm. I was going to follow up with a question with you, and guess what? Boop, it went out That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Reese can talk a little bit about your own identity search. Yeah, what was that like for you? Well, I never identified as a lesbian. I just there was no other language, and being okay. a female-bodied person, again, like you were saying, yeah. that's a label that's put on you. So, you know, growing up, um, one of twelve Catholic, um, ten girls and two boys. I mean, including me, to be determined, right? Mm -hmm. um, I fell into that label of being a lesbian because that's what everyone everyone said. You didn't I really feel like you had a choice. Yeah, yeah, but I knew, you know, probably in my 20s, I, there was no other language. Um, and that's, you know, in the 80s at this point. So there's right. no language around what I am. I did not realize I was transgender or I had a choice to change my sex until I was 39. Okay. And then I actually had a friend that was a social worker she was doing a thesis on gender mm -hmm. and transgender in particular. Okay. And she took me out for coffee and she said, how do you identify? Do you wear female clothes or male? I said, I've always worn male clothes. And then she said, well, do you identify as transgender? And I didn't know. And she gave me all these books. I went home and read them and I'm like, oh my God. This, it felt so great to be relieved of this burden of not knowing why I felt the way I did all those years. I mean, I was so on a track I, to go to school, finish, you know, undergrad, grad school, chiropractic school. That's all was on my mind and become having my career. It wasn't around um, exploring my identity right, or right. my gender. Yeah. Just, it wasn't on the table for me. Mm -hmm. And then she, when I read those books, it was a relief to know that, oh my God, this is why I've been the way I have been all these years. And so what year would that have been roughly? You know, we have a 2005. Time. Which is the first entry of the book. Oh, that's the first that's entry That's literally, of the book. What, when he's talking about, what he's talking about is the day I started to journal. Wow. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh, this is it. This is the moment. He told me that he's trans. This is what we're going to do and we're going to move forward. And, and that's what we did. Yeah. So you really didn't have a name for it for yourself. I did Until not. you read all those books. Although I had many girlfriends say, you sure you're not a boy? You sure you're not a guy? But I didn't, so still they were didn't, up something. wasn't digested mm -hmm. in yeah. me that that was even an option. It was not my community. Yeah. It was in a lesbian community. Um, and then when I realized, and with you know the education around it, reading all the books my good friend lent me, then I it evolved from there. And I moved forward with what I had to do to self-actualize into who I am today. You know, and I think it's only been <coughs> recently, I think back, you know, Minnesota being the first state in the United States to protect people on the basis of gender identity, that came in 1993. Oh. And it was after that that we started to get a much larger trans community. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I, from my perspective, it seems like maybe the last five, ten years that we've seen more and more people that are female to male. Before it was mainly which is male to agree female. With that, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. So there wasn't a lot of people mm -hmm. or there weren't a lot of people right. that yes. you could connect with. There's no with. role models. Yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, it just the information wasn't there. Mm -hmm. What were some of the challenges? We talked a little bit before coming on the air uh, that you experienced as you began to come to grips with, well, this is who I am, then what was your journey like, you know, to where you are today? Mm. Wow. That's a three-hour show. Yeah. It's a three-hour show, but you can do it and hit the highlights in a couple um, minutes. I mean, I was on a mission, All and right. that's how I, coming from a family of 12, it's really survival of the fittest. All right. So I really wasn't in tune to that, at that point of the difficulties. I wanted the end product. All right. And so I was really I was in denial about right. <clears throat> difficulties. I saw the difficulty on Allie and when she was reading her the, her entries into her for her journal that it was really difficult for her. I wanted to just be stealth. I'm a guy recognize me as this. Yeah. I would have to say the most difficult thing was not being seen in the transition and being misgendered. Mm -hmm. And people okay. constantly assuming and, and having the conversation with them that don't assume you know who I am. Okay, until so you have they a were misgendering you as female? Yes. All right. Yes, ma'am. Actually, okay. I had um, chest reconstruction in San Francisco and went to this. Um, bought a new shirt. Bought a new shirt, got a, you know, my hair cut at the barber for the first time. Yeah. We go to the market. Um, I forget what it's called in San Francisco, but. It was, it was a gentleman, very effeminate um, man. I assumed gay man, mammed me. Oh. Can I help you ma'am? And I said, what did you just say? <laughs> I mean, I'm sporting a $10,000 chest. Yeah, yeah, Don't yeah, call yeah, me yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so then they retracted and apologized, their face turned red, but it ruined my day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. then I'm questioning myself, I'm not, what am I doing wrong yeah. in being a man? Mm -hmm. I mean, which has since from then even evolved even more because we know the diversity in every, you know, population. You, know, you don't have to be a certain way. Yeah, and I don't think mm -hmm. the average person understands how painful it is, how so painful. searingly painful to get misgendered. I mean, it's well, not being seen. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. That yeah. invisibility yeah, factor, yeah. It's the right? invisibility and, um, yeah, it's, it's a very painful. Yeah. That was very painful. Yeah. I think it's really important to interject with what he just talked about around our process of getting Reese through the transition because mm -hmm. really we did it together. Is that, and, and I talk about this a lot now when I, t when I do public speaking, our story is the exception and not the rule in this community. Mm -hmm. Reese is a highly educated person, I have education, we both have really great careers. Mm -hmm. We have means, and we are a we were able to pay for all of this stuff out of pocket, right. which has well exceeded the hundred thousand dollar mark at this point in the game. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had a house we were able to sell. We took all the equity of that home to get even more surgeries taken care of. This is not the story in in the Minneapolis, Minnesota at large trans community. 
And Minnesota and Minneapolis is a hub for a lot of trans and non-binary people mm -hmm. because of the, pro the program in human sexuality at the U. Yeah. They and have a lot of, of resources. And now with the they Mayo know. Clinic getting yeah. involved, there's a lot of resources. And when people come here, this is a great city. They stay. There's a huge, we have a huge chosen family of trans and queer people. That's why we are here. Yeah. But when we see people that are asking for money to get chest surgeries, they're doing things like collecting cans and bringing them in for the aluminum. Or they're getting their hormones on the street, and when you have needles on the street, now you're going to deal with hepatitis and AIDS, and there's all kinds of problems that go. It's just paramount to, to the being a marginalized community. Right, of course. And so mm -hmm. it, I use my platform now and my voice to talk about you know, intersectionality, which is a word that everybody needs to get on the tip of their tongue in mm -hmm. 2019, and how that plays into our trans community. Because Reese and I are white, mm -hmm. and we are people of privilege, and we figure things <coughs> out with our money and our education, and we're able to get to where we are today, and we also stayed together through that, yeah. which is, to me, the absolute deciding reason why we're still okay. You know, one of the thoughts I had after I knew the two of you were coming on the show is that I don't know what, I, don't, I haven't seen hard scientific data about this, but I've heard the number maybe 20% of relationships stay together mm. if one of the people transitions. And I was, the thought occurred to me, was it easier for you because now you're seen as straight? Whereas mm. in terms of identities, people that, if they're in a straight or male, female bodied relationship. Heteronormative. Heteronormative. And then one of them has to deal with being a marginalized person as well in this same gender relationship. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, you guys in some ways are a little bit different. I don't know if I mean, it's a hypothetical question, but hmm, mm -hmm. would that make it easier or harder? I mean, we could really deconstruct mm -hmm. this. Yeah. We live in a very patriarchal society. Yeah. It is still not necessarily acceptable to go from being a man to wanting to be female. Right. Because that is as though it's a step down in our culture. Of course. Yeah. Where when you transition from female to male, well, of course you'd want to be male. Male is the top of the ladder. Yep. I don't mean to offend anyone, no, but that's the way it plays true. out right now. Yep. So trans women are incredibly discriminated yep. against just for having the desire and the knowingness of themselves that that's what they need to be. Is it not hard enough to have to deal with that physical burden and transition of your life? that you're gonna be discriminated against for being female. Why is female not as good? I, you know, we, we, need to talk, yeah. we need to open these conversations up. We need to talk about this. It's really, really important. We want and are learning to use our places of privilege to stand and open doors for people who are being oppressed because that's what it is about having privilege. You have to find a way to use that privilege to the advantage of the people being oppressed. So I think it's hard for us to even know what we're, how we're looked at by the world. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. I mean, we have our places where we feel like things have been hard for us on the inside, but yeah. people from the outside aren't gonna really see that. Yeah. I mean, the two of you look like a straight couple. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. But what that has done for you, I mean, you know, that's how you're gonna get perceived by mm -hmm. the average totally. person yeah. when you go to Target or wherever you go. But you're talking about the pain of being invisible. It that is. That then somehow your own queer identity comes into question and who validates that for you. That's a real It is. Real and everything concern. that we've gone through to be where we are right now then is not able not only to be seen but used to its greatest advantage in the community. That's why we're getting out there and doing a lot of speaking and saying, you know, this is who we are, this is what we've been through, this is what it looks like, what are, what are the issues that you're having? Because we want to create allies. And, mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. really appreciative to my partner for being visible, you yeah. know? It's a big deal. So we want to, I want to talk, we're down to about four minutes left in the show. It flew Don't by. Yeah. What, what advice or what, what do you think helped you the most? in getting through this together. I mean, you know, there are what, maybe there's more than one thing, but I think it would be helpful for people to hear 
you know, when you came to very difficult places in your relationship, what was the glue? What, what kept you together? Wow, that's a good Go question. Go ahead. I would have to say honesty about feelings and being open to listening, for me, listening to Allie's feelings and um, validating those feelings, not being defensive and, I mean, really communication skills 101 and just listening, active listening. Um, therapy helped me a lot. I did not want to be in, I did not want to be, I didn't want to evolve as being Reese, as being a man of privilege and treat women like they've been treated for okay. thousands and thousands of years. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's listening to Allie, what she needs, hearing her, and then doing it. Not, you know, being dismissive and, you know, really listening. So honesty and communication, key. And the openness you had to your partner's experience. I mean, partly you were pretty savvy about saying, this was my experience, would mm -hmm. you listen? Mm -hmm. And you said yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. then you could really kind of join each other because, you know, coming out, however we come out, is a self-absorbed process. Yeah, and hormones are very powerful. Oh, yeah. And testosterone <laughs> in particular, which I know now about. Yeah. I mean, where you don't, I wasn't listening as well. Yeah. And more, and I've always been more of a linear thinker anyway, but it was, Allie kept telling me, you're just going right to the solution. Uh -huh. You have to listen to me. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've always thought about that anyway, like where I'm like, what's the, what's, let's solve this problem. Yeah. But that doesn't work in relationships. Yeah, but so it's a different set of to, skills. Yeah. It's a different set of skills. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I'm aware of time, yes. but what, what, what would you say kept you together? I definitely went to therapy as well. Okay. I would say the strength of our love that we have and also, we're, we're very resilient. We seem to downplay how difficult things have been. We had a lot of momentum, but we, we have a lot of love. And that can bring us right to your TED Talk. You have a TED Talk I that do. our audience can access on YouTube. Yes. Tell people about your TED Talk, the name of it. Yes, it's called Love Appears in Whatever Form It Chooses, and it's on the TEDx station on YouTube. And it was at TEDx Provincetown 2018. 2018. Mm -hmm. And it's an 11 minute clip. Yep. And so I really, I had a chance to look at it. It was fabulous. Thank you. And really heartfelt. I mean, Thanks. you got up there and you really talked about a story that was your story mm -hmm. and how you went through it. True. And that love is bigger than whatever divides us. That's true. It's and true. so I, I loved true. your, your uh, book, which thank I get to you, read. Marge. But I also loved your TED talk. and. And again, thank you for being you. I mean, it would have been easy for both of you to sort of slip into the shadows, live your life, do whatever, but you want to help the community. Wow. Definitely. Yes. And you want to use your experiences to help lift other people up. And thanks for letting us be here to, to announce that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Marge. We are coming down the home stretch, and I want to thank you, Allie Sands and Reese Preston, for being on the show. And would you please join me in our signature goodbye by looking at this camera here and saying bye, bye. For, now. for now.